Okay, so welcome to the at BC LaRouche chapter meeting here in Burnaby. It's uh, February 27th, 2016. And uh, we are entering a global strategic shift in the world situation, which is absolutely incredible and would not have been thought possible before. Tonight I will try to convey this and the opportunities and signs of, uh, of this and how it works. Uh, I will deal first with the Russia-US ceasefire and second with something equivalent going on between China and the United States uh, centered around North Korea. Then I will deal with the ramifications of this in terms of the openings that have uh, occurred to our movement and to the, to the perspective and orientation that, that we represent. Then I'll deal with uh, 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 and last I will discuss the actions of the agency which has played a key role in driving the U.S. population into their current condition of not being able to know the incredible opportunity they have to, uh, for a future because the empire that they have been a part of or is now disintegrating. And essentially, part of what, uh, what the, the particulars that I'm going to discuss are have to be situated in the fact that this empire is now disintegrating and is going crazy and they're losing control of every aspect that they have had control up until now. Uh, and you, you see this in the Russia-US ceasefire situation that's emerged. Now initially I thought that they were pursuing a ceasefire for the purpose of stopping Russia's crushing of ISIS and, and, and al-Nusra to buy time to bolster their forces and to uh, um, so I, and that was always that was my initial you know reaction to the to hearing there was a ceasefire but upon a further examination of the dynamic of the ceasefire, it, it's, not, it's not coming from the United States. It was coming from Russia. Russia was organizing this. So why would Russia organize a ceasefire in a situation in which the forces on the ground and, 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 and the Russian Air Force were starting to, to uh, crush the Islamic State? Because, because what's going on is not about the Islamic State per se. It's not about Syria per se. It's about the policy fight that is going on inside the United States. I find this very shocking to think this, but I'm beginning increasingly to think that the Russians are operating, Putin is operating, from the standpoint of an intervention internally in the United States and that the military action of Russia in support of the Syrian government was done from the standpoint of making an intervention into the internal uh, process that's going on inside the United States. So this is very novel to me. And I have evidence that the Chinese on another flank are doing the same thing. Now, what this, what's, as I understand this truce and ceasefire, is that it does not include ISIS. It does not include al-Nusra. The Russians in the U.S. are going to be collaborating also with a grouping, uh, get their proper name here, uh, uh, it's called the Syrian Democratic Force, which includes the Kurdish YPG fighters 
and the Sunni tribal forces. The, the U.S. is working with them. And so now it looks like the U.S. is working with the Russia, Russia's with them. Now, uh, so what is happening is that one of the, is, is that what you have in Syria right now is every neighborhood has its own militia and warlord. And what they're doing, what the Russians are doing, are saying, okay, uh, register with us <laughs> and the United States, and then you have a ceasefire, and we will not, you know, you're, you'll be fine, we won't attack you. But not if you're ISIS or, or al-Nusra. So what does this do? It, it's, it's creating a situation where all of the non-ISIS, non-Nusra, or those who want to escape being associated with ISIS or being associated with al-Nusra have a venue to go in and make a deal to end the conflict while they crush ISIS and al-Nusra. That's the deal. And the, and, the, and the Russians are saying to the U.S., we want you pa participating in this arrangement and working with us and seeing that it works. Because we're going to end this thing because it's gotten, to the, it's gotten to a very serious point where Europe is about to collapse because of the refugee situation and other things. And this plays back into the U.S. political situation because the, there's such a clamor and... and uh, in the population, about stopping ISIS, about stopping al-Nusra, about stopping the jihadis, right? So essentially, a trap has been set in this. And what's happening is a group, a grouping within the U.S. is collaborating with the Russians, and another grouping with the U.S. is trying to not only destroy that collaboration, <coughs> but trying to, to to prevent this process from going forward. And so you have essentially a process going on. Now, so now what Russia did in Syria was not a typical invasion. What they did was integrate the forces on the ground with an air capability an advanced technology air capability. But the advanced technology air capability was not like massive. It was, it's, the Russian air presence is not massive. It's efficient. It's effective. But it's not like some massive occupation of Syria. And so what this has done is created a, a, an effective military capability. And their approach is to gradually uh, re establish control over the most populated areas and move to cut off the supplies from Saudi Arabia and most of all from Turkey and, and, and create a situation where uh, not only are the ISIS and al-Nusra if, uh, if cannot expand their operations, but they're in, a, they're in a situation where they're gradually losing ground. And this is increasing the demoralization in their, in their ranks. Because it's all based on their perception of victory. And they don't. And now they're starting, it's the whole thing starting to go. Now there's massive support coming in still from Turkey and Saudi Arabia. Some of that's being destroyed by the Russians. But this has created an incredible situation where... The Russians can now go to the U.S. and say, okay, let's resolve this thing. Let's not have a nuclear war. Let's not have, let's not get into a nuclear war over this. And so, you have a very interesting situation. Now, now this is also given those forces inside the United States that are not on board with the policy that are, Obama represents room and leverage. So the ceasefire has given them leverage. And 
we have clear indication that outside of someone like Ash Carter, who is the Secretary of Defense, the cabinet in general in the United States government is on board with John Kerry. They are not on board with Obama. What that means is that Obama is not, does not represent the majority perspective in the government and in the cabinet. He is a minority now within the consensus and, and the discussion process. Okay. And so uh, so this whole thing is being being reorganized. It's being put together. Everything is being is being put together. Okay. And so now the British are very freaked out because the British power lies in disrupting and playing an intermediary role between the U.S. and Russia. Disrupting the process. Now you have the beginnings of Russia working directly with the United States to deal with these issues. Up until now, the Obama administration wouldn't deal with the United States. They would act in a unilateral way. They would act preemptively. They would not consult with Russia. Now Russia is being consulted. This is enormously significant. Because up until now, the neocons and the Obama administration everything has, says, has said, Russia is a second-rate power. It's a regional power. We, we are not, you know, they're nobody. No, they're not nobody. you got to deal with them. you got to work with them. If you're going to do something in the Middle East now, you have to consult with the Russians. That's not the American century, my friend. That's not, project for, that's not the project for a new American century. That ain't what... Dick Cheney and, and Victoria Nuland and her husband Robert Kagan and all these people thought that they were going to end up with. This is a different world now. Okay? Now, <laughs> now we come to this very dangerous, psychotic individual. I'm not talking now about Obama. I'm talking about Erdogan. <laughs> All right. So he's going nuts. And I'll read you comments that were made by uh, somebody who, uh, who, uh, 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 who, who uh, yeah, I'll read you comments made by this person. Uh, this is, a this is an article by, in the Huffington Post by Stanley Weiss, a mine, exec a mine company executive and founding chairman of Business Executives for National Security. It was in the Huffington Post. It was difficult to imagine that any NATO member would betray the rest of the alliance. But that day has now come because of the behavior of Turkey under the leadership of its current president, Islamic strongman Recep Erdogan. Erdogan. The combination of NATO's Article 5 commitment and the lack of any formal mechanism to remove a member is a bad, in bad standing has become an Achilles heel for NATO, Weiss writes, to the point that, quote, that one day its members would be called to defend the actions of a rogue member. <laughs> who no longer shares the values of the alliance, but whose behavior puts its allies in danger while creating a nightmare scenario for the global order. So he's saying this about Turkey, which has, quote, moved so far away from its NATO allies that it is widely acknowledged to be fiercely supporting the Islamic State in Syria in its war against the West. Turkey has taken a harshly authoritarian turn embracing Islamic terrorists of every stripe while picking fights it can't finish across the region, including an escalating war with 25 million ISIS battling Kurds and a Cold War turning hot with Russia, 
whose plane is rashly shot down in November. With those fights coming home to roost, as bombs explode in its cities with enemies at its borders, Turkish leaders are now demanding unconditional NATO support. With Prime Minister Davutoglu declaring on Saturday that he expects our ally, U.S. ally, to support Turkey with no ifs or buts. So instead of coming to Turkey's defense, he says NATO should begin proceedings immediately to determine if the lengthy and growing list of Turkish transgressions against the West, including its support for Islamic terrorists, have merit. And if they do, and they most certainly do, the Alliance Supreme Decision Making Body, the North Atlantic Council, should formally oust Turkey from NATO for good before its belligerence and continual aggression drags the international community into World War III. That was in the Huffington Post. And then he doesn't stop there. He says that the er Erdogan government has made it even stronger by its refusal to recognize the U.S.-Russia truce agreement with Syria and by refusing to stop its cross-border artillery shelling against the Kurdish YPG. Quote, this Syrian ceasefire deal is not binding for us when a party is a threat to Turkey, when Turkey's security is at stake, Prime Minister Davutoglu said. When Turkey's security is at stake, Turkey will not get permission or ask permission from anyone. We will do what is necessary. So anyhow, so this is very, this is very significant. Now, the, there's another wrinkle to this, which is very serious. Um, and that is that um, uh, and that is that um, what's this thing called? Okay, you have something called the Schengen system, which is an agreement that was made in Europe that allows the free movement of people between European nations who are signatories to the European Union. So people can move freely. And the refugee crisis is causing an end to the Schengen system, which means you no longer have the free movement of people in Europe, which is the beginning of the end of the European Union. Now, December 7th is a big day on this, because that's when the EU meets with the Turkish government, and the Turkish government is holding European ho Europe hostage by threatening to release all the refugees into Europe. December 7th. December 7th, no, I mean uh, February, uh, March 7th, I'm sorry, March 7th. So they're talking about mo after March 7th, if these massive wave of refugees come, come in, European countries will end the Schengen Agreement, named after a town in Europe. And this is, the, this is bringing down the European Union, or at least in that sense it's bringing down the European Union. So this Turkish thing is really something ugly and very nasty. And who's behind the Turkish operation? Obama? The British? They're still encouraging him. The British are still encouraging him. So this is part of the whole uh, situation. So uh, now we have we have quite a situation emerging where you have Kerry on one hand doing this, and then you have Ash Carter and Dunford and John Brennan, the CIA director. Dunford is the chief of staff. And the NATO commander, Breedlove, saying the exact opposite. And Breedlove, and, and Ash Carter and Breedlove went to Congress to get further appropriations. And they said, and he said, uh, NATO commander Philip Breedlove, he said, Russia has chosen to be an adversary and a long-time existential threat to the U.S. and U.S. partners and allies in Europe. To counter Russia, uh, the European Central Command, working with its allies and partners, is deterring Russia now and preparing to fight and win if necessary. I mean, you can't be more belligerent. 
This is in the middle of the, 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 the ceasefire just being worked out between the United States and Russia. Ru Russia is extending its course of influence yet further afield to try to reestablish a leading role on the world stage. No. They have, they're not trying to establish a leading role in the world stage. They have established a leading role in the world stage. <laughs> they're not trying. It already has happened. So, so this begin now. The now the Europeans are calling for a arms embargo on Saudi Arabia because of the atrocities in Yemen. So this thing is 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 turning against the British. Now, now who are the friends of Obama in the Obama administration? Who are the who is the core of the Obama crowd? Okay, and uh, this is this is very interesting. Uh, um, okay, I'm trying to find this here. Anyhow. Second here. Okay, basically, the kind of people that Obama is part of, this woman who's the Attorney General, Loretta Lynch, is the one who let who let um, Hong Kong Shanghai Bank off the hook. No, for laundering drug money. Okay, and a part of the court agreement was that that there would be a, a, a monitor of Hong Kong to see if they follow the, uh, the, the precaution. The, uh. Now, a guy who in this process got put in to the executives, chief of, one of the top executives of Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, who was part of this whole process, then gets picked by Obama to be the Attorney General of the United States. <laughs> And the monitor's report is now being prevented from being made public by the Obama administration. That this is the company that Obama keeps. The people who work with support Hong Kong Shanghai Bank's money laundering of the drug trade. This is what you're dealing with. So that gives you some idea of what we're dealing with here. Is this public knowledge? Yeah, but that's what we'll get to that part later. So, so what you have now is a process going on, and it's not a process that's going on with John Kerry personally. It's a process going on within the institution, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. Now, I can tell you that it is my view that the Russian intervention into Syria was coordinated secretly with elements of our State Department and elements of our intelligence community of the United States. There are indications in the Seymour Hersh article on, on, re related to this, but this truce thing didn't happen because Kerry got on the phone with LeBron, or he met with LeBron. This whole thing had been worked out beforehand. It had been worked out in secret. Because the Russian behavior in Syria conforms to the fact that they had worked something of this understanding out before. You cannot explain what is going on as something that's just happening because it's happening. Because people are responding all of a sudden to a situation, and they're now getting on the phone and, yeah, we got to do something. No. This is a pre, this was planned, as far as I'm concerned. This is not what the, the movement is saying. This is what I'm saying. Are you thinking it has anything to do with LeBron and Kerry spending that week together? I'm saying it, it, it's not just Kerry and LeBron. There's all kinds of discussions were going on between experts and policy people. 
but behind the scenes. This is not, this was not done. They set up Obama. To, they, this was done to set up Obama and the British. This was done to set up Obama and the British. Because the behavior of the Russians is not, is not typical of, of, of a mere antagonism against the United States. So, now, and then if you add the other factor of China coming into the Middle East, of Xi Jinping going to, to Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Iran, and of the whole discussion of the Silk Road and the economic development of the Middle East, you don't just have a political solution, but you have an economic agreement. And there was an economic agreement behind the Oslo Accords, but it, didn't, it wasn't followed through on, which is ultimately one of the reasons the Oslo Accords were, were, were destroyed. That would have, would have ended the whole Palestinian-Israeli situation, conflict. So this time, there is an economic uh, proposals, economic policies coming in as part of it. So, So you have this coordination with Russia by the Chinese. And now, the Obama British crowd pulled a, a big one in North Korea. The North Koreans tested a intercontinental missile and they did some tests or whatever. And then the Obama administration, the Obama and the, and the Defense Secretary came down on, the, on South Korea. And they, they practically broke the President Park and forced her to go against her previous position, which is to accept the ABM system that's designed for China on the basis of the, the North Korea situation. So what has happened? This is very interesting. The Chinese foreign minister, Wang Yi, comes to the United States. He meets with Kerry. What are they discussing? Resolving the situation in North Korea. And what is the discussion being made? Well, there was never a truce signed to end the Korean War. And what the North Koreans are saying is, if you, if, you, if you guarantee our security, we will be willing to get rid of our nuclear arsenal. We will be willing to get rid of our nuclear missiles. And the Obama administration is saying, you get rid of it first. And the North Koreans are saying no. But now the Chinese are intervening. are getting involved. With who? With John Kerry. And now they're starting discussions and negotiations about how to actually do that. To, to disarm North Korea and guarantee North Korean security. So that's starting. And then there appear articles in the South Korean uh, paper saying, well if that process goes on then we won't need to have these this ABM system that the U.S. is trying to impose on them. And then, the Chinese and the Russians <coughs> are coming in saying, we need this economic development quarter in northeastern Korea, North Korea, which will become the key railway link and the industrial quarter that connects Russia, China, and South Korea. Again, there's an economic development aspect to the whole uh, North and South Korea situation. <coughs> this is a mirror in part of what you're seeing going on with the truce and the Chinese coming in with development projects. They can't have a prolonged war in this region. You got to get this economic development thing going. You can't have, you know, you have four million refugees, I think, have left 
Syria, and you got another 7 million refugees inside, dislocated inside Syria, all because of ISIS and now Nusra, because of the because of the Obama administration, because of the British, and the British are howling right now. This thing is not under their control anymore. It's starting to go out of their control, and they know this, and they're freaked out. And Obama is being isolated. And what you see emerging, the beginnings of it, is an actual policy center centered around certain policies, which has the potential of being consolidated, from which a, a profound change in the U.S. is possible. And whoever gets elected to the presidency will be under that policy group. It's the policy group and the policy which is primary at this point. The particular bozo that's going to get elected is secondary. And, it's thought, and, and pretty soon we'll probably see, a, 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 we'll, we'll have an idea of who the, who, who the, who the potential bo actual bozos are. How about Ted Cruz? Huh? How about Ted Cruz? Uh, I don't think he's acceptable to this policy crowd, but anyhow, <laughs> uh, anyhow, so, so now uh, I want to go through the, the oaks, an example of some of the openings that are now occurring. Okay, so you get a sense of this. Now you have to understand that Lyndon LaRouche is the most slandered, vilified figure in, in, in U.S. politics for the last four or five decades, for the last four decades. Okay. And anybody who comes anywhere near us gets attacked. There's articles about, you know, what's his name, the, the head of the uh, uh, UK Labour Party. Corbyn. Corbin happened to send a video to one of our conferences in Australia, and he got hammered for being associated with cult leader and criminal Lyndon LaRouche. Yeah, and he had, I think some of his people had to do a disclaimer, you know. And so this gives you some idea of, of, of how, how, how bad it is for you to have any association with our movement. It's bad in the U.S. So, how, so, I found out today that yesterday, our young, uh, our young individual that you see on, the, on all the shows, uh, Matthew Ogden, was the keynote speaker at the McCord School Policy Conference in Georgetown. Now, McCourt School is one of the nine schools to buy time to bolster their forces and to, uh, um, so, I, and that was always, that was my initial, you know, reaction to the to hearing there was a ceasefire. But upon a further examination of the dynamic of the ceasefire, it, it's not, it's not coming from the United States. It was coming from Russia. Russia was organizing this. So why would Russia organize a ceasefire in a situation in which the forces on the ground and, 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 and the Russian Air Force were starting to, to uh, and is going crazy. And they're losing control of every aspect that they have had control up until now. Uh, and you, you see this in the Russia-U.S. ceasefire situation that's emerged. Now, initially, I thought that they were pursuing a ceasefire for the purpose of stopping Russia's crushing of ISIS and, and, and al-Nusra. Okay. Okay, so, welcome to the BC LaRouche chapter meeting here in Burnaby. 
It's uh, February 27th, 2016. And uh, we are entering a global strategic shift in the world situation, which is absolutely incredible and would not have been thought possible before. Tonight, I will try to convey this and the opportunity. Uh, and last, I will discuss the actions of the agency, which has played a key role in driving the U.S. population into their current condition of not being able to know the incredible opportunity they have to uh, for a future, because the empire that they have been a part of or is now disintegrating. And essentially, part of what uh, the the particulars that I'm going to discuss are have to be situated in the fact that this empire is now disintegrating. These and signs of uh, of this and how it works. Uh, I will deal first with the. Russia-U.S. ceasefire, and second with something equivalent going on between China and the United States uh, centered around North Korea. Then I will deal with the ramifications of this in terms of the openings that have uh, occurred to our movement and to the, to the perspective and orientation that, that we represent. Then I'll deal with uh, uh, 